Okay, so feminist counseling. Before we get started, let's kind of take stock at uh, what some of your thoughts and feelings are. Uh, I know you, some of you may have heard some things about feminist counseling, and I know you've read the book chapter, and I have to admit that I don't think that this is the best chapter in the book. I looked around for something that was better, but couldn't find anything that I was really satisfied. So I just stuck what with, with what was in the textbook. So uh, spend a few seconds and just reflect on these things. What, what is it that you like and dislike about this approach at this point? What would you change about it if, if you could change something about it? And why do you think that so many people have such strong reactions to this theory? So people seem to either really love it and embrace it or really hate it. And I'm curious what your sense of that might be. And then as you reflect on these things, uh, I always think it's good to, to ask yourself, and what does this say about me and what I value, who I am? Uh, so look inward a little bit. Some basic ideas uh, about feminist counseling. It's really based on the idea that the broader social context has an impact on how we function, on our mental health, our well-being, how we relate to other people. And so these theories, this theory really pays attention to that broader social context. And the idea is that, that we can't separate or understand people fully if we don't understand their social environment and how that social environment is um, encouraging them, inviting them, forcing them to, to behave in certain ways. Uh, and so it sees that, that the broader society and broader culture is part of the problem and therefore should be part of the solution. Feminist counseling is an outgrowth of the historical and political feminist movement, but it's important to remember that there's really no organized or centralized path through which feminist counseling developed and nor is there any one way of being a feminist counselor. It's a, a loose collection of approaches and ideas that are based on some similar core values and principles, but there is no one feminist counseling. And again, while, while gender remains a central idea in feminist counseling, the approach has opened up to include a lot of other social issues as well. Okay, so the, the thinking component of the theory, and remember when we're, when we're trying to case conceptualize or when we're considering the, the thinking element of a theory, we're really looking for two things. How does this theory explain the, the problems that clients have and what does it suggest that we need to do about it? So in very broad terms, uh, the idea here is that, that client concerns are rooted in unhealthy social pressures or social injustice, you could even say oppression that it's those bigger social forces impacting on individuals and families that cause the kinds of problems that bring people into counseling. So if that's what causes problems, it makes sense then that change will emerge from people becoming aware of how society is exerting that influence or that control, from people taking back some of their own power um, to be able to to not be influenced by those pressures or not at least determined by those pressures. And then finally from, from individuals and families and communities working to change those social systems that are creating the unhealthy uh, client concerns, client problems. So how do we do that? Well, we have to start with assessment. And in this approach, assessment kind of has two, two purposes. The first is for the counselor and the client to identify what ways is the broader society, the culture, the social context, how is it having a negative impact on the individual or the family's functioning? So just identifying and being aware of that, knowing what they are. But at the same time, that's part of the intervention itself, just raising the awareness of individuals. So it's both an information gathering as well as a, an intervention or change agent to just become aware of what the impact uh, of the broader society is on the individual. Now to, to do this as counselors, to, to gather that information and to raise that awareness, we, we better have some solid awareness ourselves of how is it that society impacts individuals and people and what are the ways that those social injustices or those uh, 
oppressions um, hurt people. So let's spend just a little time here talking about some of the ways that our broader society can impact our functioning. And we're going to focus on gender since that was kind of the root and the beginning of this approach. But we could do the same thing with, with race, with uh, sexual orientation, with lots of different classifications. We'll spend a little time uh, doing some of this in class as well tomorrow. But let's take a look at, at gender and how our views of gender have shifted historically. Initially, there was this idea that there's just one sex, and it was male, and uh, women were therefore somehow defective men. I mentioned in class the idea that uh, for, for some time, people thought that women were just men turned outside in, and that's where this is all about. So that's a, a drawing from an anatomy textbook that shows the, the male and female sexual organs, and it's hard to tell the two apart. They don't really look that way, but because they had this belief that there was just one sex, when they would look at anatomy, that's how they would see it. They would see it as one sex. Uh, this idea gave, gave rise to the notion that women were merely just property. Since they're defective men, uh, men are in charge, men are superior, women are just property. Over time, fortunately, we, we left that notion and we agreed that there are two sexes, but still the idea was that women are inferior to men. Yes, they're different and they're inferior. We've moved to a more modern approach that says, yes, that there are some differences, but really we should be equal. And then a, a postmodern shift beyond that would be the idea that we're not really different at all. We're, we're equal. Uh, we're the same except for just some, some basic and some largely unimportant anatomical or physiological differences. So over time, our, our view of gender has shifted. And I think in each stage, people have thought, though, this is, this is the truth. This is what's right. And the way we relate, the way we treat genders is based on that truth. So it's good to recognize that, that it's kind of a moving target and our views are evolving and what's right and what's seen as appropriate is not necessarily based on truth, but based on what's popular in the culture at the time. So what do we currently think as a society and as a scientific community about the differences between the genders, how we're different, how we're similar, and what of that is based on our biology and what of that is based on the way we're socialized and raised to be men and women? But well, we do know that there are some biological differences between the sexes, and I'm not just talking about the obvious ones. But we know that women tend to be healthier. They tend to live longer. They tend to have greater physical endurance and fewer genetic defects than men. But we know that men have greater kind of um, raw strength, greater uh, bursts of energy. So while the women might be better at, with endurance, men are better at kind of just the raw power. We know that our brains function slightly differently. We've probably all heard about how women tend to be stronger with ling linguistic ability. And I think that's important to keep in mind because counseling is largely a linguistic endeavor. And it's a little bit biased towards women who function and, and appreciate that linguistic exchange. Men tend to have uh, strength uh, mentally in uh, spatial reasoning and understanding spatial layouts versus that uh, linguistic ability. Women tend to be able to think in parallel. They can operate their mind on multiple streams at the same time, whereas men tend to operate more in serial, one thing at a time. Uh, while women tend to not be able to shut their thinking off, there's been some interesting research that suggests that to some extent men can do that. So when a woman asks a man, what are you thinking, and they say, nothing, they might really be telling the truth, that, that their brain kind of goes into this kind of just ready mode where it's not really processing things. And women are, in general, less able to do that than, than men. So there are some, some biological differences. Um, but there are also some powerful social differences. And my example there, the, the different types of Lego toys are inviting people of different genders to play and to be very, very different. So what are some of these social influences? Well, we know even before we're born, how our parents decorate the nursery. What colors do they choose? What images do they choose? 
we're already starting to suggest that there are certain ways to be as a boy or a girl in the world. Once they're born, same thing, the clothes that we buy, the toys that we, that we buy for the children, the different activities that we encourage or expose our children to are suggesting that there are proper ways to be as a, as a man or a woman in our society. This is fascinating to me. Again, we tend to see what we want. They did a series of studies called the Baby X Studies where they took an infant just wearing a diaper, <clears throat> so you couldn't tell by looking at the infant whether it was a boy or a girl, and they asked uh, participants in this study to describe the baby. Some of them they told, uh, they, they didn't say, this is a boy, please describe its behavior, but they said, tell us what, what infant John is doing. And they would describe it. And others, they said, tell us what infant Jane is doing. And based on what the people thought the gender of the baby was, they would describe the baby's behavior in very gendered terms. So they were seeing the same exact behavior. They just had a videotape of, of the baby just kind of doing some things showed them the same video, but based on whether they thought it was a boy or a girl, they saw a very different behavior. So we're reading into our, to, to children, and I don't think it's just to infants, but we read into what people do based on our perception of what that gender should be doing. We know that, that peers have a huge role in kind of encouraging certain types of behavior and the media influence, it would be hard to, to underestimate how powerful the, the influence of media is in terms of suggesting, encouraging, inviting certain types of behavior and discouraging other types of behavior. Now when we look at differences between groups of people, we have to be a bit cautious. And I'm going to use gender again as an example, but this would apply to any type of grouping, ethnicity, language, sexual orientation. But we often like to, to point out the differences, and when we do that, we're looking at kind of a normal curve. If we were to say, here's the way that uh, talkativeness is distributed for men. Some men are very low in their talkativeness, some are high, but in average, there's level right there in the middle at the peak of that, that curve. And then we were to graph for women talkativeness, and we were to compare the two, we could accurately say that on average, women are a little more talkative than men. And a lot of people just stop there and focus on that difference. Wow, women really different than men. And we forget that there's a whole lot of variation within each of those groups. And that that within group variation is bigger than the difference between the two. And then finally, that there's a tremendous amount of overlap where both men and women are, are pretty much the same. So yes, in, in some ways we can say that there are some differences, but we have to be careful drawing too many conclusions about those differences. Because in, in general, most people are very similar to each other, no matter how we're slicing up our, our differences based on group. So I'd like you to take a minute here and uh, be a bit reflective. Maybe jot some things down, bring them into class, and we'll have some conversation about this tomorrow or on Monday uh, when we meet. But uh, consider these things. How is it that these social expectations about what's appropriate and how to behave and the pressure to conform to those expectations, how do, how do they get communicated in society? How is it that they impact men and women, either similarly or differently? And then get beyond gender and consider other social dimensions, things like eth ethnicity, uh, affectional orientation, age, religion, ability status, any others that you can think of. What are the pressures? What are the oppressions? How do they get communicated? How do they affect people? And then perhaps most importantly, can you think of examples from your own life where you've experienced some of these pressures and how has it influenced how you think, how you feel, how you behave as a member of our culture and society? Another key area for clients and counselors to understand is power and how it influences us how we sometimes perceive to have perceive ourselves to have little and what we can do about that and power we're thinking of it in kind of a different way than maybe the broader society does we're talking about the the ability to shape our own destiny to influence the environment and to influence others so it's not power in the sense of haha i'm strong but power in the sense of 
hey, I can make a difference in my world, move my world the way I want it to go, what's going to be best for me, for my community. So when I think of powerful individuals, I think of some of the, the people whose images are, are on this PowerPoint. Uh, earlier, Harriet Tubman, a, a powerful person. Think of the things that she did to help uh, shape her own destiny, shape the destiny of other African Americans who were at the time in slavery. The gentleman there on Tiananmen Square, uh, how powerful that is. To So the power is not in the tanks in my mind, although yes, there's some power there. But what I think is really powerful is how he chose to, to make a difference in the world. Gandhi as well. He didn't have, uh, he, he was a pretty small, thin uh, gentleman, but incredibly powerful in, in influencing his own destiny and the destiny of, of a billion people in India, really powerful in influencing the whole world. And you'll see some other people that I think were pretty powerful. So power is not about control. And this approach would consider that control is really abuse. The idea is that, that we want to help have people have acknowledge and recognize and, and have the right of self-determination to be able to, to determine their own destiny and, and the ability for all people to make important choices uh, in their lives is, is central and kind of key to this approach. When we think about oppression, oppression is the lack of this power in, in our lives. As clients and counselors, it can be helpful to recognize different types of power. We're going to divide these into two broad categories. First, we'll call freely given power. And my example there is the, the nuclear explosions that are taking place in the sun. Um, they give us all life here on the planet. That's what sustains us. So it's, a, it's very powerful, but it's a, a, a kind of a, I wouldn't say benign, but it's a helpful life-affirming power. Good to also remember that it can be uh, damaging. If we get, if we just lay out in the sun all day, we're going to get a, a sunburn. If we get too close to the sun, we're going to fry. So it's not completely benign, but in general, it's a life-affirming power. So there are, are these kinds of power we would call referent power, where because I admire you, that gives you some influence over who I am. Think about celebrities or sports heroes how we give them some power to influence the way we think, the way we behave, the activities that we want to do, maybe how we dress. Much of um, Hollywood advertisement is based on that notion of referent power. You get someone who's popular, get them to sell uh, a product, and that influences people. Next, legitimate power. If I believe you've got some sort of right to influence me, I might give you the power to influence me. Uh, police officers, firemen, often because of their role in society, because of their uniform, we think, oh, this person has a right to tell me what to do right here or to invite me to do something, and we give them power. Expert power, kind of the same, but based not just on the idea that they have a legitimate right, but that they have some level of knowledge or skill, some expertise that we think, oh, I should listen to them. And then finally, persuasive. If I, if I believe in what you're telling me, if I believe that you're persuasive, then I give you that right, that ability to, to influence me. So important to remember there that in each case, I'm the one that's got the power uh, and I give it to certain people to influence me based on those characteristics. Well, not all nuclear explosions are, are life affirming. There's a dark side to that. and We'll use nuclear bombs as the dark side of that power. So there are some forms of power that are very manipulative. And we'll look at both reward and, and coercive power. And that's based on someone's control of desirable resources. And because they control those resources, they can reward certain people and they can punish other people. And that doesn't necessarily control me. Someone can withhold food from me and I can choose to not do what they want, but that's going to be a powerful invitation. They're going to be manipulating me to, to give them some influence over what I think and, and do. So two types of Two broad types of power and some different examples under, under each one. All right, so all that previous stuff about the impact of society and power, that was all in the context of the assessment where we're trying to help people be aware of how society might be playing a role in the concerns that bring them in. So then what do we do? 
Well, as far as some guiding principles for, for what we do with this, this theory, here's a couple. We're trying to move towards greater social equality. We want people to be able to balance relationship and independence. It's not that either side of those extremes always needing to be in relationship or just being a strong individualist. Neither is healthy. We want some balance there. We're always looking for ways to help empower people, to help claim the power that is rightfully theirs, that ability to influence their own destiny, to influence others around them in healthy ways. So the sun side of power, not the nuclear bomb side of power. We want to encourage people to, to, ha to take greater care of themselves, to feel that that's a right that they have to, to nurture their own well-being. And there's a strong value of diversity. So some general goals in feminist counseling. We want to increase awareness of, of gender and other social issues. How, how are these social issues impacting people? We want to help them regain their power. And we want to, to create broader social change. If all we do is help some individuals survive, probably not as helpful as if we can actually create some change in broader society that will prevent some of those problems. All right, if that's uh, what we're going to do, then how do we do it? What are some of the techniques associated with this approach that's going to move us in that direction? So consciousness raising, that can take place just through the conversations that we have, exploring how people um, move around in their society, how society influences them, and how it's related to whatever their, their concern is that they're bringing into counseling. They also do a lot of bibliotherapy, helping people read about um, issues in society and how those issues affect people can be a helpful way of, for them to recognize, oh, I see what's going on. It's not that I'm somehow defective. It's that I live in this society that's causing me some, some concerns, some problems. Part of that might include what we call a gender role analysis. So really taking a detailed, specific look at how they perceive their gender role, what it means to be a man or a woman, where they learned that from, how it affects them, how they feel about it, how other people feel about the way they perceive their role, really teasing that apart. And that in and of itself can be empowering. But they also might do something called a power analysis to take a look at where do you feel powerful? Where do you feel powerless? Uh, whose power uh, is really at play in your life? And how can you reclaim some of the power that's rightfully yours? Again, power in terms of that the ability to to determine your own destiny. Some training on assertiveness, on how can you learn to, to function better in your world, uh, in this society that is in certain ways maybe oppressing you or powerfully manipulating you to think and feel certain ways. How can you be more assertive against other people, against other components of society that are, that are pushing you that direction? Doesn't mean being combative, doesn't mean being aggressive, it means being assertive. Helping people identify resources in their community, within their social network that will help them to feel some sense of stability, uh, to, to help regain some of that power can be important and, and helpful to people. Then finally, as, as the book mentions, we often invite people to take social action. If they find that their community has a, a certain bias or there's oppression operating in their life, to help them become empowered to do something about it for themselves, but also to do something about it for others. As people join groups, uh, not only do they get some sense of relief from seeing other people that are dealing with the world the way they are, but they can work together to, to create broader social change. So beyond these kind of basic guidelines, feminist counselors might integrate a lot of techniques from other approaches that we've studied. Uh, they might do some role plays, they might assign homework, they might use some cognitive behavioral challenging of, of thoughts, looking for ways that behaviors are reinforced. Bring a lot of that stuff in, but all with the intention of, of working towards empowerment, towards greater awareness, consciousness raising, and then creating broader social change. Well, what about being? The feminist counselors really value an egalitarian clinical relationship. And I, I've got there the question, is that really possible? I, I've mentioned before in class that it, it can never be fully egalitarian because the client is seeking us out, coming to us. They put us in that expert role. They're giving us some of that expert power 
just based on the, the way it's set up. But as, as feminist counselors, we would not want to highlight that or take advantage of that in any way. We don't want to perpetuate any kind of oppression that might, they, the client might be experiencing in their world. And yet, at the same time, sometimes the feminist counselors can appear a bit directive. They, they definitely have an agenda. Now, I would say that's, that's not terribly different than many of the other approaches we've studied. The, the psychodynamic counselors have a very psychodynamic agenda. The cognitive behaviorists have a very cognitive behaviorist agenda. So it's true that the feminists do have their own agenda related to, to broader social forces. Um, and so sometimes they can be a bit more directive than, than the humanistic approaches, than existentialism or than person-centered counseling. So there's this a little bit of tension there between really striving for an egalitarian relationship and yet powerfully inviting clients to think and feel and act in certain ways. There's a greater willingness in this approach than in, in most of the others that we'll look at this semester to, to self-disclose. The idea is that they will, the counselor might share many of their own experiences with gender, with race, with sexual orientation, with whatever, as a way of kind of creating community, which in and of itself is empowering. Helping clients realize that they're not alone in their experiences can be empowering in and of itself. And then finally, the notion is that, that they appreciate the importance of a close relationship. So they're gonna, gonna strive to use all those core counseling relationship skills to create a, a, a strong bond. All right, some closing thoughts then. It's important to remember that, that feminist counseling is not a counseling approach by women, for women, and about women. It doesn't include any male bashing or glorification of being victims of society, none of that. It's really an approach that tries to address all of the issues where broader social forces are limiting people, constraining people, oppressing people. Um, we want to try and work to overcome that. And it's interesting to me that, that as a field, as a, as a profession, when we join uh, this profession, we're really taking on an obligation to do that in some way with our clients, that we have a responsibility to try and recognize and build the dignity and worth of all people, regardless of their gender, their class, their ethnicity, their anything. We should value their dignity and try and enhance that dignity in the, in the broader society. And the Code of Ethics actually says that when we recognize that people are not able to do that, when there are forces in society that are constraining them, that we have uh, an obligation as counselors to be advocates for them. Because society has given us some power based on our education, our position in the community, we have an obligation to try and uh, work to support the, the well-being and the dignity of, of all people. And to me, I find that hopeful. Uh, I think that's a nice thing. Right, so as we prepare for class on Monday, keep in mind some of the, the things that we've talked about here and that you've read about. Uh, bring in your kind of jotted down notes about the ways that you've experienced uh, unhealthy influence, constraints, limitations, expectations from society. And we'll talk about and do some things with those. And then give some thought for how this might apply with Opie. What could we say that he might have experienced from the broader society. I think we've talked a lot about some of the expectations within his community for him, and that could fit in with this, but think bigger than that in terms of what it means to, to be maybe a man in society, what might Opie have learned that's getting in his way now, um, and then what would we do about that? So have some, some plans for how are we gonna conceptualize this case? How are we gonna make sense of it? How is it gonna guide us uh, in what we do with him? and we'll, we'll do some good role plays. Thanks. Oh, sorry for this. I know this one's a little bit longer than, than a lot of the others, and I never intended it to be that way, but there you are. Sorry about that. See you on Monday.